Well, today we're going to do our fifth lesson into the book of Malachi. Uh, I hope you're enjoying it as much as I'm enjoying bringing it to you. I love the Word of God. I hope you can tell that. I love, and I love God and His Word. <laughs> I know you do too. Uh, before we finish uh, chapter 2, uh, this is just interesting, but, but before we finish just chapter 2 out of this short book, uh, with, from the prophet Malachi. <laughs> Maybe even today's lessons, we're going to find the answers to many of the social ills and political ills actually in America today. Uh, it's amazing. You know, God's word is truth. We're going to look at that verse today. But, you know, when a, when a people or a nation rejects the truth, they will believe a lie. And it was happening in Malachi's day. It's happening in our day. God does not change. His word does not change. Thank God people can change. I thank God for that. All right, without further ado, let's, uh, we're just going to pick it up where we ended last week. And uh, so let's read Malachi chapter 2 and verse 10. We'll start today where we left off last week. Have we not all one Father? Hath not one God created us? Why do we deal treacherously, every man against his brother, by profaning the covenant of our fathers. Now, God is the father of all mankind, but that's really not what the prophet Malachi is saying here, and it's not what God is saying through the prophet. He's talking about God being the father of the nation of Israel. Um, <laughs> he is referring to God being the father of the Jewish nation because God made a covenant with a man named Abraham. And through Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, he made covenant. And there would be no Jewish nation if God had not made covenant with Abraham. So when he says, we're all, we all have one father, he's referring in that case to the Jewish nation. Now God is the father of all people, of course. But in the context here, he's talking about God being the father of the Jewish nation. And he's talking about that covenant. That, that was established. Verse 11, Judah hath dealt treacherously, and an abomination is committed in Israel and in Jerusalem. For Judah hath profaned the holiness of the Lord, which he loved. Now notice, here he's going to tell you how. And hath married the daughter of a strange God. This, this is exactly... What he's talking about, the people, well, we'll get to it here in a minute, they were actually marrying pagan daughters, non-Jewish women. These, they were marrying women who worshipped other gods from other countries. See, this is the very sin that Solomon practiced that really started the ball rolling that eventually led to the destruction of the nation. And to see that, go to 1 Kings chapter 11. We're going to read a pretty long passage here, uh, verses 1 through 8. But uh, God had forbidden them to marry the daughters of these pagan nations. And he was very specific why. He said, if you marry them, they will turn your hearts to worship other gods. And they did. <laughs> and King Solomon was... <laughs> Can I say one of the very worst? So let's go here at 1 Kings 11, verses 1 through 8. But King Solomon loved many strange women. He doesn't mean they were weird exactly. <laughs> he means they were not Jewish women. They were from other countries. For kings, But King Solomon loved many strange women, together with the daughter of Pharaoh, so that's an Egyptian woman, women of the Moabites, Ammonites, Edomites, Zidonians, and Hittites, of the nations concerning which the Lord said unto the children of Israel, You shall not go into them, neither shall they come in unto you. For surely, now here's why, they will turn away your heart after their gods. Solomon clave unto them in love. And he had 700 wives. Okay. 
I, I, I hear the prompting of the Spirit now. See, later on, <laughs> notice it says, Solomon clave unto these in love. Well, I love them. I couldn't help it. I hear that all the time as a counselor. These young women, you know. I know the Bible says I'm not supposed to marry a non-Christian, but I love him. Well, <laughs> honey, I don't care what your emotions, your, your feelings say. And so God didn't care what Solomon thought either. See, Solomon thought he loved all these women. You're going to see it as a bunch. <laughs> that doesn't enter into the equation. When God says don't do it, he means don't do it. Solomon's doing it eventually led to the destruction of a nation. Sin has consequences. Okay. Verse 3. Now, I'm going to read that verse again. That's just too, too strong. Verse 2. Of the nations concerning which the Lord said unto the children of Israel, You shall not go into them, neither shall they come in unto you. For surely they will turn away your heart after their gods. Solomon clave unto these in love. Oh, but I love them. Mm -hmm. And he had 700 wives, princesses, and 300 concubines. <laughs> and his wives, now notice, turned away his heart. What did God say? <laughs> God knows the end from the beginning and he says don't do it because they'll turn away your heart. But Solomon loved them. And these young women, I can't, you know, we canceled. Usually it's not normally the guys, it's the girls. But I love him. I know he's not a Christian, but I love him. Don't do it. God says don't do it. If you're a Christian woman, don't you marry a non-Christian man, period. Anyway, verse 4. For it came to pass, when Solomon was old, that his wives turned away his heart after other gods. I have to say again, what did God say? <laughs> and his heart was not perfect with the Lord, his God, as was the heart of David, his father. For Solomon went after. Now, when it says went after, it means he also went in and worshipped. He burned incense too. He... he Solomon went after Ashtoreth, the goddess of the Zidonians, and after Milcom, the abomination of the Ammonites. And Solomon did evil in the sight of the Lord, and went not fully after the Lord as did his father. Now this part, is, I remember when this first hit me. Solomon? Then did Solomon build a high place for Chemosh, the abomination of Moab, in the hill that is before Jerusalem. And if that wasn't bad enough, and he built one for Molech, the abomination of the children of Ammon. Molech is where they sacrificed the children. They would offer their babies and their, their young, very young children, burn them alive. I've taught on this before to this false god of, called Molech and Solomon. When it says he built a high place, one translation says a sacred shrine. When it says on the hill opposite of Jerusalem, one translation says the Mount of Olives. I'm not an, I've never been there. But can you imagine building a sacred place? To burn incense and pray on the Mount of Olives? <laughs> and likewise did he for all his strange wives, and these don't mean they're weird, it's the wives, these pagan wives from other nations, which burnt incense and sacrificed unto their gods. Solomon burnt incense right along with his wives, and he actually built these sacred places to go worship. <sighs> but it gets even worse. I mean, that was bad enough. That's what started this ball rolling this time. It's not, I mean, Solomon wasn't the first man to ever do this. We could go back. We could, I may do a whole study one time about, about this because there, there was a pattern established early on for this and it just keeps happening all through the Bible. Anyway, that's another another series we'll do it another time see but it gets even worse than just marrying these pagan women in this case 
Not only were the men marrying the daughters of strange gods, but they were divorcing their Jewish wives in order to do so. In plain language that we'd use today, they were divorcing their Jewish wives and marrying these younger pagan women. <laughs> I started to write these young hotties, but that's, that's not <laughs> churchy enough. <laughs> that's what they were doing. Not uncommon for older, you know, middle-aged men, little older men, ah, divorce their, the wife of their youth and go marry a, a younger one, you know. Well, these are, these are divorcing their Jewish wives and they're marrying these pagan women. Let's continue in Malachi here, chapter 2. Let's see what God thinks about all this. <laughs> Malachi 2, verses 12 through 14. The Lord will cut off the man that doeth this, the master and the scholar. In other words, it doesn't, I don't care if you're uh, very highly educated and well-trained in the, the ways of the world or the ways of religion. I don't care who you are. He's going to cut you off out of the tabernacle of Jacob. Today, we would call that like excommunication. And we're not going to allow you to uh, take communion with us, that type of thing. In other words, God says, if you do this, the Lord will cut you off. You may go and take communion, but it won't be honored by the Lord. And him that offereth an offering unto the Lord of hosts. He's going to cut that off too. In other words, I, he's not going to receive your offering if you do this. He's not going to receive it. Verse 13. And this have you done already. Now notice this. Covering the altar of the Lord with tears, with weeping, and with crying out, O oh God, insomuch that he regardeth not the offering any more, or receives it with good will at your hand. Lord, I, I, uh, I know that I disobeyed you. I know that I divorced my wife, uh, my Jewish wife, and I, I went and married this young pagan hottie over here. <laughs> I know I did all that, Lord, but and I, and, I, and I knew I was doing wrong when I did it. And, but see, I just did it anyway because I love her. He can use whatever excuse he wants. But then, God, ever since then, I've noticed you don't receive my offering and you don't answer my prayers. And I'm just crying. I'm, gonna, I'm just going to cry here, Lord, so you'll see how pitiful I am and, and that you'll answer my prayers anyway, won't you, God? You'll answer my prayers anyway, won't you? Mm -hmm. God says, nope, not going to do it. Verse 14. Yet you say, wherefore? Because, because the Lord hath been witness between thee and the wife of thy youth against whom thou hast dealt treacherously, yet is she thy companion and the wife of thy covenant. See, they have broken the marriage covenant. And at the same time, by marrying these strange women, they've broken the covenant of God by breaking his commandment not to marry these pagan women. They're, they did it anyway. They broke the marriage vow, the marriage covenant, and they broke their covenant established through the fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And then they're going, answer my prayer, Lord. I'm bringing, it's like I'm bringing an offering. You're going to bribe God. <laughs> I'm bringing an offering. Why won't you answer my prayer? I'm, oh, I'm so, I'm just covering the altar with my tears. Why won't you answer my prayers? Well, you broke the covenant. These men were in, now again, as I know in this series, it looks like I'm looking down a lot. It's because I'm reading. Because this is a line upon line teaching. And it's important. There's times that he allows me to just minister by the Spirit. But then there's times for line, and line upon line teaching. Which this is through the book of Malachi. So i got to stay real close with these notes. I do not want to leave out anything important. So these men were in complete disobedience to God. By treating their wives this way by marrying pagan women, and by bringing weak, sick, remember the first chapter, weak, sick, broken lambs for offerings to God. They were just totally dishonoring God. They weren't bringing Him any glory. They were just bringing the bare minimum. They didn't care. Then they would, oh, and they're divorcing their, no matter, I don't care what God said. See, I don't know how, I don't know how many women that we've counseled, not, don't marry that guy. He's obviously not a Christian. And they oh, I love him, like Solomon. I love these women. Mm -hmm. 
they married him anyway. I, I, they did not. It did not turn out well. God knows the end from the beginning. Will you please understand? Father knows best. <laughs> when he when he gives us commands, it's for our good. But I love him. Uh, you'll we'll see what that's like five years down the road. Okay. Then they would pray. At the, these men would pray at the altar after. The, at the, okay, I brought a, I brought a blind sheep, <laughs> a lame, broken sheep. Oh no, I brought one that wandered into my yard from my neighbors. Yeah, there's one. I'll just offer that one. I, oh, by the way, I divorced my wife, and 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 because I, 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 I wanted to marry this this younger pagan woman. God, you know, I love her. <laughs> and now, you know, they're turning his heart away to other gods. He were not even God didn't even talk about that yet. Why won't you answer my prayers, God? Why won't you answer my prayers? They had no respect for God. God see, they had no respect for God and God would not respect their offerings. God would not respect their prayers. Real simple. Say now, well boy, I'm glad that's the old covenant and it sure doesn't apply today. I can I have all these preachers that tell me that sin, that my sin doesn't separate me from God, and I can, I can live any kind of lifestyle I want, and I can, I can get drunk, and I can fornicate, and I can do marijuana, and I can do all this stuff. And now I'm talking, now if it's if it's truly medical marijuana, that's one thing. Uh, vast majority is not, not that. <laughs> They're getting high on it. I'm getting high on marijuana, and I'm doing all this stuff, and. God will still answer my prayers, won't he, Brother Gary? <laughs> well, won't he, won't he, Prophet Malachi? <laughs> well, let's see what John says about this. You know, uh, the Apostle John. Go, uh, go over to First John, chapter three, and look at verses twenty-one and twenty-two. Before I even read it, I'm ready to set it up again from the Old Testament. God, I brought you an offering. Mm -hmm. Blind, sick, broken legs, <laughs> stolen. Uh, God, uh, I, I, but I brought you an offering. I'm in the temple. I'm here. I've got serious needs, and I need you to answer my prayers. Oh, I know. I know. I divorced my wife and, and and my Jewish wife, and I've married this pagan woman. And and yes, she's she. I go to I go to her temple with her, and and but you'll still answer my prayers anyway won't you god I'm, I'm praying here at your altar you'll answer my prayers anyway won't you so my question was does that apply to us today first john 3 verses 21 and 22 beloved if i f <laughs> if now that means there are conditions to answered prayer here if our heart condemn us not then <laughs> I underlined then if our heart condemns us not then have we confidence toward God okay let's stop for, stop wait a minute what if our hearts condemn us what if I know that I did wrong and I haven't repented what, if, what Gary what if what if my heart is condemning me then you're not going to have confidence toward God See, and everything in the kingdom is received by faith. If you don't have confidence. Anyway, verse 22. So if, and then then, we have confidence toward God, then I underlined and, <laughs> verse 22, and whatever we ask, we receive of him because. <laughs> Boy, underline because. We receive of him because. We keep his commandments and do, I underlined, and do those things that are pleasant, that are pleasing, brother, in his sight. What? You mean I have to keep his commandments in the New Testament? <laughs> what? You mean I really do have to forgive that guy that treated me so wrong? I, I, really, I really do have to... Have to have to love my enemies. I really do have to pray for those that despitefully use me. Uh, you, you mean I need to honor God and and what? <laughs> now let me just read it without all of my emphasis. First John three verses twenty one and twenty two. You want to have your prayers answered, beloved? If our heart condemn us not, if our heart condemn us not, 
then have we confidence toward God and, and whatsoever we ask, we receive of him because we keep his commandments and do those things that are pleasing in his sight. I haven't been getting my prayers answered. I don't know what's wrong, Brother Gary. Are you keeping his commandments? No. Are you doing those things? That are, are you doing what he told you to do? No. And you're surprised? Your prayers aren't getting answered? Hmm. So you can't live in constant disobedience and expect him to answer your prayers. They couldn't expect it in Malachi. You can't expect it today. Are you living to honor Him? See, this whole book, I told you at the beginning, is about where is my honor. Jesus lived to glorify the Father. He says, I've not come to do my own will. I've come to do the will of the Father who sent me. Did you know Jesus said about us, I, Father, I have sent them the same way you sent me. Our lives are about glorifying Jesus, honoring God, hearing and obeying the voice of the Lord. Bringing glory to His name. See, see, how about seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. And all these things shall be added unto you. See. Mm. Alright, now back to, the, back to Malachi time now. <laughs> so here's what's going on. These men are divorcing their Jewish wives. And they're marrying these younger women. And the, the, the reason God was, it's not a racial thing, it's a, it's a religion thing. It's who are you going to serve? He told them why he didn't want them to marry them. He said, they'll turn your hearts after other gods. Okay, picking it back up in Malachi chapter 2, let's read verses 15 and 16. Did not he, that's God, make one? Yet had he the residue of the Spirit, and wherefore one? Now that's a little King Jamesy, we'll get to it in a minute that he might seek a godly seed. Therefore, take heed to your spirit and let none deal treacherously against the wife of his youth. In other words, stop this. Stop it. Don't be divorcing your wife that you married when you was young that bore your children. For the Lord, the God of Israel, saith that he hateth putting away, in plain English, plain modern language, he hates divorce. Divorce is not the unpardonable sin. We'll get to that in a minute. But he hateth putting away, for one covereth violence with his garment, saith the Lord of hosts. Therefore take heed to your spirit that you deal not treacherously. Plain English, don't divorce the wife of your youth. In their case, don't divorce your Jewish wife. See, in Malachi chapter 2, we find God's plan for mankind, if you want to know the truth of it, in these few little verses here, as he refers all the way back to Adam and Eve in the garden. See, he's telling about, why did I make them the way I did? God made them male and female, husband and wife. God, in the beginning, designed the building block of civilization and that is the family unit. He says, why, why did I... I want to I use Gary's words and stuff. That verse, there's a little King Jamesy. You know, God originally made the man Adam. We're not teaching on Genesis today, but he, from the dust of the ground, he made the body of Adam, breathed life into him. Then eventually he decided it's not good that the man be alone. And he took, you know, Genesis says a rib out of the side, not from the feet, but from the side of Adam, and from that he, he made a, a woman. So God made them male and female. Now what he's saying is, why did I make them in such a way that they could become one? Uh, being nice, why did I make male and female in a way that their parts uh, would fit together in such a way that they could become one? Well, he's telling you he wanted godly seed. He wanted children. That's why he made them male and female. So I've got a bunch of notes here. Let me just read it. Let me just talk about the family unit that God designed from the very beginning. See, in modern times, I love this. He said, I wrote here, you know, God has no difficulty defining what a woman is. 
because God made them male and female. He has no problem deciding. He, he, yes, I can tell you what, a, there's a man, there's Adam, there's Eve, there's a woman. God has no problem defining what a woman is. See, Jesus, he, he repeated this statement in Mark 10, verse 6. He says, but from the, from the beginning, he's talking about divorce. They'd asked him a question about divorce. Why did Moses allow us to get a divorce? He says, from the beginning of the creation, God made them male and female. From the beginning of the creation, from the beginning, this was God's idea, not man's. You had nothing to do with it. From the beginning, God, from the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. Notice, there is no mention of bi or trans or any of the LGBTQ+. <laughs> he made them male and female. And, more than, and even more than that, God is the one that instituted marriage. God's plan for mankind is that man and a woman be married to produce children. God designed marriage to be a male and a female, a husband and a wife. Notice he did not make multiple wives for Adam. He could have, but we're seeing God's original plan. Monogamy forever. You've got to remember God's original design, there was no death. So he, he, he thought his design was for like one man, one woman, like Adam and Eve monogamy, married to each other, to them only, forever, because death wasn't even in the original design. Now, for us today, one of the uh, patterned after that is part of the most marriage vows, until death do we part. But it's, to, I'm, I cleave to you and you alone. I forsake all other women. You, or the woman, I forsake all other men. I'm making covenant with you and you alone till death do we part. So God's design for the family unit was a father, a mother, a husband, a wife, and children. See, and God did it that way because the family unit is the building block of civilization. <clears throat> and that's why in, this, in, this, in these end times, the devil is working so hard to destroy the family unit. If you haven't noticed, he's after your children. He is after the children. And he's out to destroy the family unit. If Satan has his way, the state, the state will own your children. They'll be the, they'll be, belong to the state instead of you, mother, mom and dad. You better wise up. <laughs> Why did God make male and female in such a way that they are able to join together as one flesh? He plainly says he wanted godly children. I see, you can just so easily see the purpose of God. God, again, God made the man from the man. He made the woman. He made them male and female in such a way that they could come together and become one in the flesh and produce children. Then he says godly children. He wanted them raised godly. Now, with that in mind, there is no purpose in that plan for male and male to be married. There is no purpose in God's plan for female and female to be married. No children can ever come from that. There is no purpose. This is not in the design of God. And that's why he says in Leviticus 18.22, Thou shalt not lie with mankind, as with womankind. Now notice, it is abomination. It's a, just an abomination. This is not part of God's design. Okay. Now, beyond that, God has no plan for sex of any kind outside of the marriage covenant of one man and one woman. Heterosexual sin is just as much sin as homosexual sin. Any sex outside of marriage is sin, period. God's plan, now, he did make sex pleasurable, but pleasure is not the end goal 
of sex children was. It's just so simple. I thank God he made, we're all happy <laughs> that he made it pleasurable. That ensures the propagation of the species, doesn't it? <laughs> we're going to do that again. <laughs> But really, though, I mean, that's a, that's a bonus. The pleasure part's a bonus and, and an incentive to do it again. But that was never the goal. Pleasure was not the goal. Children was his goal for making them male and female. Okay. Now, he doesn't want just want children. Notice he says godly, godly seed, godly children. And that, that just reminds me of, this is really for every parent. And it's Proverbs 22, verse 6. Train up a child in the way he should go. And when he is old, he will not depart from it. Let me straighten up here a little bit. and Have a little lubrication of the pipes here. <clears throat> read, that, read that again. Proverbs 22, and verse 6. Train up a child in the way he should go. And when he's old, he will not depart from it. See, if you have children, uh, I'm, talk I'm not talking about the you know, 18, 19, but if, you're, if you have young children in the house and you're not having regular Bible reading as a family unit, please consider doing so. Start doing it right away. Uh, See, you, you may or may not feel qualified to teach the Bible, really, but you can sure read it. Read it to your children. God's words are seeds of life. They, yeah, Jesus said here, you can look it up in John 6, verse 63, if you want. Jesus said, the words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. Another place, he said, heaven and earth will pass away. My words will never pass away. Just read, make sure your children, have, you know, that you've read to them about David and Goliath, uh, all, all of, uh, about Gideon, uh, all of the stories, Samson, uh, uh, Jericho, make, make, or Jesus, <laughs> dear Lord, read, read the Gospels to your, to your children. Now, back, getting back to Malachi here and the subject of male and female, divorce and all of that. See, God made them male and female. Now listen, you are not God. <laughs> I don't care who you are. You cannot change the gender that you were born with. And there's only two. There's male and female. For those who try to change their sex, even after all of the surgeries and the hormone therapy, still your chromosomes are XX or XY. You can't change them no matter what you do. And did you know that those chromosomes are in every cell of your body? I don't care what surgeries you do. I don't care how you change your outward appearance. I don't care the hormones that you take. None of that will change those chromosomes. You're either XX or you're XY. And you can't change it. You're not God. See, transgender people think that they are in the body of the opposite sex. Some even think <laughs> that they're an animal. In the body of a human. You ever heard of a trans species person? Now, the most extreme case that I've heard of personally, and this, I mean, I read this in, a, in an article. This is not made up or somebody just told me. A person went to a surgeon trying to get him to remove that person's left arm. Why do you want me to remove your, your arm? Looks fine. Why do you want it removed? I don't think this arm belongs to me. I believe this arm belongs to somebody else. I, I'm looking for this. I've been turned down by other surgeons. I've come to you. Will you take my left arm off? Will you remo remove it surgically? My left arm is not mine. Yeah. We have compassion on everybody, but let me just tell you plain, that person does not need surgery. They need therapy. They have a mental health issue. Or 
They're being, they might need deliverance. It might be the influence of a demon or it could be both. See, so much of this transgender stuff is simply mental illness. And you notice it's increasing exponentially now in the teenagers of America. Why? Because it's being talked about a lot. They never had such a thought. Most of them would never have had such a thought if it wasn't on their social media. Talked about all the time. Now there's an epidemic of this. It's a mental health issue. It's worse than that in a way. What's really causing it is departing from truth. See, the truth is you were, you were, God made you male or female. That's the truth. You can't change it. No matter what you do, you can't change it. So, well, I don't like that truth. Well, truth is truth. It doesn't matter whether you like it. See, Solomon, I, I love those women. Doesn't matter your affection for them. God said, don't marry them. Yeah, but I love them. I want to marry them anyway. Well, wound up destroying a nation eventually. See, divorce itself is covenant breaking. You know, when you actually get when you get married, it's God's involved in a real marriage. You're swearing. You're making. You're both making covenant before God. I, re, I forsake all others. I cleave only unto you, till death do we part. Okay. Divorce is covenant breaking. God hates divorce. Now listen, I have to put this in there. Divorce is not the unpardonable sin. Pastor Dave tells a story about this young woman that he that he counseled and she had been married for quite a while, had children by the first marriage, got in a divorce, don't know any details, got in a divorce. Years later, she remarried somebody else and they, they started attending a, a church. And then when the church found out she was divorced, they said, oh no, no you, you, you have to leave your current husband. Oh, and the children that you've had by him, you gotta leave him. You gotta go back to your first husband and ask him to divorce his wife that he's married now and, and, uh, and to remarry you and only then can you be sanctified and accepted by God. <laughs> Dave's counsel I thought was brilliant. He said, no, just just go murder your first husband. <laughs> of course, he was kidding. But he's trying to make a point. Now, just get you, get you a big old handgun and you find your first husband, just shoot him dead. And he says, because that same church that's condemning you for divorce, they'll forgive you for murder. They'll have, they'll have revival meetings and advertise, former murderer finds God. Come and hear the testimony. <laughs> They treat divorce like it's the unpardonable sin. It's not. And there are scriptural reasons for divorce. Of course, the first one is adultery. Jesus himself said, and except for the cause of fornication. So adultery is breaking the covenant. And if you decide to, you don't have to, but if you decide to, if your spouse commits adultery, then there, that's grounds for divorce. Another one is physical violence. Physical violence. What's the term today? Domestic abuse, I guess. Domestic abuse. And then the third reason given in Scripture for divorce is if the un, if you if you if you were if you have an unbelieving spouse, and that spouse is not willing to have your home be holy, especially if there's children in it. If he wants to bring pornography or drinking or whatever into the house, and he's not willing to live holy, and he wants to depart. It's okay to let him go. You can get a divorce in that case. So um, adultery, physical violence, which would include neglect, by the way. What I don't mean just, he, he, what I mean is uh, not providing for his family. And then un, the un, unbelieving spouse decides, okay, I, I want to live my sinful ways. I don't want to be married to you anymore. If the unbelieving spouse decides to leave, you can, you can get a divorce in that case. That's okay. See, all of this, all of these problems in Malachi and in our day today is because we have departed from the truth. In John 17, 17, Jesus said, Father, what Jesus said to the Father, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. Sanctify. What does sanctify mean? Sanctify means to set apart. The world does not know the truth. 
The world has rejected God and his Bible, which is his truth. They have rejected God. And if you're going to be sanctified, set apart, a difference made between the world and you, it's through the truth of God's word. It's through the truth of knowing Jesus Christ. Jesus said, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. Receiving Jesus is the pathway of truth. Now you've stepped on to the path of truth. See, Satan is the father of lies. You've got to remember his original strategy against Eve in the garden was, hath God said. In other words, he is hit the way his number one modus operandi is to get you to doubt the word of God. Hath God said? He's always that that same foundation of lies. Jesus called him the father of lies, meaning in all the universe, everything that God created, there was no lie until Satan spoke one. Man, we could do a whole series right there. <laughs> Hath God said, you can hear the enemy all the time, hath, did he really say that? Is that what he meant? I wrote this in all caps. If you reject the truth, you will believe a lie. Something will fill that void. If you reject the truth, what did Jesus say? Thy word is truth. If you reject the truth, you will believe a lie. Turn over to Romans chapter 1. and we, The Apostle Paul in this chapter just lays out perfectly what has happened in our generation, what happened really in Malachi's generation, what, happened, what has happened in, uh, that helped bring about the destruction of Israel. Romans chapter 1. Let's, let's read verses 21 and 22 to start off. It says, Because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God. Neither were thankful. When it says they glorified him not as God, meaning, uh, we, yes, we know you. Yes, we've, we know your word. Uh, but we're not going to acknowledge you. Uh, we want to do something different than what your word says. And we're not thankful either. <laughs> See, an unthankful attitude is a big part of the problem in Malachi. Here God has just by His grace and mercy, has allowed them to come back to their homeland, rebuild the temple. Now the walls of Jerusalem are being rebuilt. Are they thankful? Are they full of gratitude and worship? No. They're just going through the motions of religion. They're bringing, they're doing the bare minimum. They, they, they even, they dislike the drudgery of it. They're, they're not happy with their Jewish wives anymore. Now they need a younger pagan wife. They're not thankful, okay? Now notice, I'm going to start again, try not to comment quite so much. Because that when they knew God, they glorified Him not as God. Neither were they thankful, but became vain in their imaginations. And their thinking became foolish. Vain means empty, worthless. And their foolish heart was darkened boy i wrote this in all caps professing themselves to be wise they became fools come on down to verse 25 how did they how did they become fools who changed the truth of god into a lie and worshiped and served the creature more than the Creator, which is blessed forever. Who is blessed forever. Amen. Now, for this cause. What cause? They changed the truth of God into a lie. They knew He was God, but they did not, they did not acknowledge Him as God. They were not thankful. And they changed the truth of God into a lie. For that cause, for this cause, right here, God gave them up unto vile affections. For even their women did change the natural use 
into that which is against nature. And likewise the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust one toward another. Notice God calls it lust, not really love. There's a slogan right now, love is love. You know? What they're talking about, it God calls it lust. It's not love. Men with men, working that which is unseemly, King James is real nice, and receiving in themselves that recompense of their error, which was meat, it was, that's what they deserved. And even, now get this, even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge. I don't want to hear your word. I know what, I've heard what it says. I don't want to retain that. I'm not going to keep that. I know you said this is sin, but I'm, I'm not going to retain that in my knowledge. If you, if you keep at that long enough, God gave them over. Boy, scary words. God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. Two of the, there's two phrases in that passage that are just two of the scariest words in the whole Bible. God gave them up. God gave them over. See, over the course of these many years, I've had many people come to me and they're, they're afraid that they have committed the unpardonable sin. And uh, they're worried that they've done that. But see, if they are afraid that they have committed that sin, if that fear is in them, then I know that they haven't. God hasn't turned them over to a reprobate mind. See, God is long-suffering. He, he was dealing with, he's still dealing with this nation of Judah. He's still dealing with them, even after all their unthankfulness and everything that's happened. And even the way they're treating him now, still, he's through the prophet Malachi, he's going after them. He, he's a father going, please repent. Please turn back. Please honor me as your father. Because he knows what will happen if they don't. So can you see he's still going after them? He, otherwise, he wouldn't send the prophet. Isn't that right? He, he wouldn't have sent the prophet. He's still after them. He wants them. He loves them. He's trying to restore them. But listen, God, Jesus will give you space to repent. Even in the book of Revelations, he gave Jezebel and her followers then space to repent long space sometimes he's long suffering his mercies are new every morning thank god for his mercy but the truth of it is if you want it bad enough it's like i'm dealing with you i'm trying to turn you please don't go that way please don't go that way please don't do it don't do it but if they persist long enough if that's really what they love they don't want him anymore God will give you over. God, there's scary words right there. God will give you over. See, and Pastor Dave says, what's a reprobate mind? What is it? When God actually turns you over? See, it's not that he wouldn't take you back. He would. But once you've really crossed over to a reprobate mind, it's not that God wouldn't take you back. There's just nothing in you that wants to come back anymore. You're really lost. There's nothing in you that wants to come back anymore. That's a reprobate mind. So if people are worried that they might have committed that, trust me, they haven't. They just need to repent and be restored by the blood of Jesus. Because once you've really crossed over to a reprobate mind, you don't care whether you committed it or not. <laughs> See, these people that, that reject God by rejecting the truth, which is His Word, by refusing to honor God and to glorify Him as God, they turn truth into a lie. At that point, they don't know what truth is anymore, see. Elites today cannot even define what a woman is. I'm sure you've seen that on the news. They, these elite people that, that think they should be in the highest places of our government, which, anyway, don't want to get into that. They can't even tell you what a woman is. They are so deceived. 
And what's happened is women don't, they don't even know the purpose of a woman. They don't know what a woman is. Men don't understand what a man is and the purpose of men. Uh, let me say it this way. Women, women, if you reject the truth, women don't know how to be women. Men don't know how to be men anymore. And some, some humans, even they fall so far from the truth, they think, I'm actually a cat in a human body. Oh my goodness. See, when people reject the truth, there are no limits then. When, I'm going to say it another way. When you reject the truth of the Word of God, because the Word of God is truth, when you reject the standard of truth, what truth really is, now there's no limits to the lies you can believe. There's no limits anymore. See? You want the Bible definition? You notice when Paul started that, he says, professing themselves to be wise. They became fools. You know what the Bible definition of a fool is? Let me read it to you. It's Psalms chapter 14 and verse 1. The fool hath said in his heart, there is no God. See, today we're living in the days like the book of Judges where every man did that which seemed right in his own heart. There is, in other words, there is no absolute truth. There's only relative truth. There's only truth as how it applies to how I interpret it and how it would apply to me, how I understand it. Every man is doing what seems right in his own eyes. This, in America, the, the elites have decided there is no absolute truth. So when they say that, what they're really saying is there is no God because Jesus said, I am the truth. If you reject truth, you reject Jesus. If you reject Jesus, you reject God. And if you, if you, if you, if you reject God, you're a fool. <laughs> the fool has said in his heart, "There is no God." All right, back to Malachi. We're doing pretty good here. Malachi chapter two and verse seventeen. You have wearied the Lord with your words. Yet you say, wherein have we wearied him? When you say, every man, every one that doeth evil is good in the sight of the Lord, and he delights in them, or you could say it this way, where is the God of judgment? <laughs> where is the God of judgment? See, they were so deceived, these Malachites. We've already been through, they were bringing weak, sick, broken legged, stolen offerings to God. They, they think they're righteous. They're, they're dishonoring God in so many ways. They're ignoring His plain command not to marry these pagan women. They're divorcing their, their wives. They don't care what happens to them. They just divorce them. and go. They are doing all of these things, rejecting the Word of God, turning the Word of God into a lie. Yet they themselves think, oh, why aren't you answering our prayers? How come you're not judging that wicked person of somebody they considered wicked? If this is not the epitome of what Jesus taught in Matthew 7, can the blind lead the blind? You know, here we're judging people over an, uh, something that's legitimate. I mean, they sure have got a problem. But you don't recognize you've got a problem of your own ten times bigger. <laughs> you know, you got, they got a splinter in their, their eye. You've got a whole log. You've got a beam in your eye, you know. So they saw themselves as righteous and other people as being wicked. They were blind to their own disobedience. Religion will do that to you, by the way. See, if, if they, what if God answered their prayer? I want you to judge them. Well, if He judges them, He's going to judge you by the same standard. See, they should be, this group in Malachi should be really glad <laughs> that God was not moving in personal judgment on other people because if he if he did he's no respecter of persons if he's going to judge them he's going to judge you too and based on what we've seen here in the book of malachi they ought to be really glad that he's not coming as the god of judgment see here it is from uh, matthew chapter 7 if you want to turn there verses 1 through 3 and of course this is part of the or at the conclusion of the sermon on the mount Judge not that you be not judged. Now notice, for with what judgment you judge, you shall be judged. And with 
what measure you meet, it shall be measured to you again. In other words, same if you're going to judge them, if, you, if you're after God to judge them, well, in that same measure, He's going to judge you at the same time. Verse three, and why shouldest, oh, excuse me, and why beholdest thou the mote that is in thy brother's eye, like a little splinter, but considereth not the beam, and it's like a beam of a roof, it's holding the roof up, considereth not the beam that is in thine own eye. See, they saw other people like getting away with their wickedness, whatever it was, with things. Yet they are totally blind to the fact that they're just as guilty as those other people. They want them judged. But be careful what you ask for. Because if you ask God to judge them, well, what if He answers that? If He does, He's going to judge you by the same measuring stick. Do you really want that? <laughs> to the people of Malachi, it's like, you sure that's what you want? I, I don't ever want to be found guilty of wearying the, the Lord with my words. You know what they're, they're really doing? They're actually indicting God. Why don't you judge them, God? They saw the wickedness of other people, even though they were blind to their own wickedness. They wanted others to be judged, but they certainly did not want to be judged by the same standard. So what we really want is uh, from Psalms 19, verse 14. I'll just read it to you. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my Redeemer. Boy, that's what we want. Now, when I forget how long ago it was, I remember I was praying and meditating Malachi and I've been wanting to teach this book for decades and he wouldn't give me permission because there were parts of it I still didn't understand. And I'm sure I'll understand even more 10 years from now. Oh yeah, I'll still be here. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> than I do today, but he's released me to teach it. I was meditating on all of this that we've talked about today. Let me just read it the way I wrote it. Then it dawned on me. It's like kerplunk. <laughs> Like when a quarter, you can hear it hitting the, the, the bottom of the vending machine. It's there. This revelation just dropped in me. They're, they're asking, where is the God of judgment? Where is the God of judgment? See, their, their disrespect, the, these people in Malachi's day, they didn't understand why they couldn't just bring a broken-legged, blind, sick, stolen sheep. What does it matter? See, their disrespect for the offering. Not really, I don't know how much they understood about, it was really speaking of the day when God would offer His Son, the Lamb of God, that takes away the sin of the world. But because of their disrespect and their, their covenant breaking and their twisting the Word of God to make it just say what they wanted it to say, because of all that, it made them blind to the truth about the God of judgment. They didn't really understand. Thank God. He is also the God who would have mercy on all of us. By pronouncing judgment, He is the God of judgment, but He pronounced that judgment on His Son instead of on you. God. He pronounced judgment on His Son instead of on Gary. Thank God for the God of judgment. He is the God of judgment. See, if you're still in Romans, go to Romans 11, verses 32 and 36. Now in the context here, he's talking about the Jewish nation. But it really, this truth applies to the whole world. For God, verse 32, For God hath concluded them all in unbelief. Why? That He might have mercy upon all. He is the God of judgment. Oh, the depths of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God, how, in, how unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. For who hath known the mind of the Lord or who hath been his counselor? Who hath first given to him and it should be recompensed unto him again? For of him and through him and to him are all things to whom be glory forever. Amen. And while we're, while we're here now, let's get a second witness. Go to Second Peter 
chapter 3, verses 9 through 14. See, the Lord is not slack concerning his promises, as some men count slackness, but is long suffering to usward, and not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also, and the works that are in, shall be burned up. Now notice this next part. See, that's the truth. We talked about this before. Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in all holy conversation and godliness. Don't live for the world. Everything you see, everything you touch, even the universe itself, even the heavens, are going to melt with fervent heat. There's going to be a new heaven and a new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness. I sure want to be on that one. I want to live there on that earth. What manner, how did he put it? What manner of conversation should you be living now in all godliness? Mm. Verse 12, looking for and hasting unto the coming of the day of the Lord, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth, wherein dwelleth righteousness. Verse 14, Wherefore, based on all of that, beloved, seeing that you look for such things, be diligent, be diligent, that you be found of him in peace, without spot, and blameless. Where is the God of judgment? They're going, where is the God of judgment? Oh, he is the God of judgment. But he's also the God who loves you. See, John 3, 16, now Here's the God of judgment. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever, that whoever, whosoever believeth in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. He is the God of judgment. But He judged His Son instead of you. He judged His Son so He could have mercy on you. And for the whole earth, it's the same. The God of judgment has judged the Son who took your place. If you've never asked the Lord Jesus into your heart, this is your moment. Just say this simple prayer. Father, I see that I am a sinner. I understand now that your Son took my place and the judgment that I deserved was placed on him. I believe, Lord, that he is the Son of God. That judgment, he took my judgment upon himself. And I believe, Lord, that you raised him from the dead, meaning the price has been paid. Jesus, come into my heart. You are my Lord from this day forward. I'll serve you. I'll listen to you. Your word is truth. I will live by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. You're a Christian now if you prayed that prayer. In Jesus' name, welcome to the family of God. We'll see you next time.